Hello and welcome to episode 26 of Mjolnir the Movies. Uh, this week, because it's the 70th anniversary of the publication of George Orwell's 1984, we thought that we would do Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Uh, so um, we'll uh, come on to that there, because there, there is a connection. With me as ever to do this are uh, James and Neil. Hello to you. Hello. Hello. Now, I thought that we'd look a little bit about Terry Gilliam himself as a director, because it's the first time we've done Terry Gilliam. And he has a distinctive style, I think, of filmmaking. What, what do you make of that? How would you describe it exactly? For me, his movies seem almost like you're watching a pantomime, but it's being filmed and played back to you. It doesn't feel like a film set. It feels like a, a theater that you're watching, or like a, a stage show, like Dancing on Ice, or, or a, a ballet, or an opera of sorts. It doesn't really feel like a, like a film. And I think the reason for that, especially in this film, in Brazil, is that everything seems fake. Everything seems as if it's been created specifically for a purpose, just to look like it's playing the part. And a lot of his films are like that, I've noticed. I would say yeah. it's very much a, a surreal, dreamlike world he always makes each time. Nothing really makes sense. There's, there's nothing logical about the design. Things wouldn't work in real life and so on. Just like in a dream world, you know, you could open up a cupboard and the inside of the cupboard's ten times the volume on the outside. You've got scenes like that in this where you've got completely illogical heating systems and so on that we see later on in the film. Yeah, there, there is definitely a, a lot of that to it and this goes back to his animation uh, if you remember of course his animation in Monty Python's Flying Circus where you get bizarre little streams of animation where things don't really make sense one but one thing leads illogically into another mm. seamlessly but yeah it doesn't make sense and you get this and, turned up even more with a more sinister bit in his 12 monkeys film he made later on yeah yeah that, that's that's right and the Fisher King as well. Mm. My favourite, The Brothers Grimm. I watched that recently and I was surprised at how good it was. I thought it was going to be some sort of Hollywood drivel take on The Brothers Grimm and it was Terry Gilliam's drivel take on The Brothers Grimm but at the same time it was really funny and uh, I just I thought it was one of the funniest films I've seen for a long time but it still had that element in it where you felt like you were watching a pantomime. Yeah, very much so. Going back to his influences as well for animation, because talking about this illogic and these contrived machines and so on, uh, you got two big influences. One was W. Heath Robinson, uh, who was a British illustrator, and he drew these really weird contrived contraptions that were used to do very simple things. So the, the whole thing would become preposterous, of course, this, uh, this huge contraption to do something ridiculously simple like blowing out a candle or something like that, you know, with all the pulleys and uh, cams and things like that. So that was one influence. Another was Tex Avery, and particularly Tex Avery's House of Tomorrow, if you remember the cartoon or cartoons by Tex Avery when you were a kid. Certainly they were on the television quite a bit when I was a kid. But again, in the House of Tomorrow... You've got all these ultra-modern appliances, these futuristic appliances, semi-robotic and so on, for doing household chores. And they would malfunction extremely comically and go completely crazy. And so you can see that very much in Brazil as well. The last thing that uh, really on this sort of vein as an influence is Harvey Kurtzman and Mad Magazine. And Mad Magazine, you can absolutely see the influence on Gilliam's artistry. So, for example, heads coming open and things flying out and that kind of thing. You know, tongues going in one ear and out the other. That kind of preposterous thing. You get that sense of absurdity in Brazil. So there is a fantastic element to it, particularly in the dream sequence towards the end. Yeah, and I've noticed that, that in, in the film there seems to be a gadget or a contraption or a machine for everything. It's like these people don't know how to do anything for themselves. They don't know how, how to even make toast for themselves. A machine does it for them. A machine makes their coffee and 
spills all over the toast and ruins it. But they don't seem that bothered. They don't seem to have any life skills. It's like these people are controlled and guided by every bit of machinery that they have or contraption they have. And this was, what, 1985? It's a good, um, what, 34 years now? Mm. And and that's what life's becoming now with things like Alexa, Amazon speakers. uh, Your phone listens to every word you say and gets things for you. And you see that in this film. It looks absurd. And I imagine it would have looked absurd back then. People would be thinking there's no way life will be like this. But we're seeing this very same thing playing out right now in front of us. Yeah. And the other thing about all the gadgetry as well is that it looks weirdly archaic as though at one instance it comes from the 1930s or 40s or something and in another from the future which is what we call retro futurism yeah and some, some things are really sleek aren't they some of the computer keypads they look like computer keypads of nowadays but other things are like mechanical like they're industrial machines for doing the simplest of jobs well, ge- generally, the keypads are not keypads at all, but typewriters. Yeah, e- yeah. Even though they're computers. and mm-hmm. and But they're computers that run sort of on valves and ducts. There are an awful lot of ducts in this, yeah. <laughs> in, in the world <laughs> of can, Brazil. And they can be broken by actual bugs, like insects, and not bugs in the system, like uh, we, we think of now with viruses and trojan viruses and spyware and malware uh, in this film we see that it can be all falling apart because of an actual bug or a cockroach yeah that's right because it, it's a although it's a computer it's on the typewriter system and and everything goes on paper rather than into some kind of database although there must be databases because things are kept on record and machines can transfer data from one machine to another and print it out. But things are constantly being printed out. Yeah. And people who watch this, if you decide to watch after listening to this, if you live at home or if you, you live in some kind of apartment or flat, think of all the paperwork that gets sent to you. And you're expected to read all of it. And at the end of it, you have to sign it and send it away or you have to um, sign up to some contract. And this film does that as well. It just throws paperwork and big, long sentences and complicated phrases at people and codes. So nobody really knows what's going on. They're so confused by it all, but they've got no experience to learn and better themselves because machines do everything for them. They don't need to know things. They just need to sign dotted lines and do what the paperwork tells them to do. Yeah, that's right. In many ways, this is a critique of a society that is post-industrial and very much capitalist uh, that will come on to that in a little while but certainly the machinery the people have become almost a part of the machine yep except and, for the main character who is not really a machine he, he's a, almost like a free thinker he's the one that doesn't step in line he goes his own way even though he's this normal kind of guy he's got a receding hairline he's getting on a bit in his years he's not exactly very muscular or athletic, but in his dreams, he becomes this sort of heroic angel type figure with armor. And that's who he wants to be. But that's who he really is deep inside. And regardless of these machines doing things for him and the paperwork that he has to sign, um, he's still this, this free thinker or this, this freedom fighter underneath all of it, underneath the suit that he wears. Well, I, I see it another way, personally. I see it in some ways as a metaphor for a midlife crisis. In oh, other so. ways, I also see this guy as basically daydreaming for the heroic because he can't fit into this world. If you notice throughout the whole film, he's a square peg in a round hole and he doesn't fit into the machinery of society at all. And in fact, the actual machinery often turns against him. Yeah, he's yeah. a good representation of what you imagine the audience would be watching this. Very much so, yeah. Because the society itself, of course, is made to be viewed as preposterous, which it is. And he's, if you like, although he's teetering on the brink of insanity, it's because the society itself is insane. Mm. But all of it is, all of it seems to be. He seems to be the only one that isn't in line. And he becomes the hero that he is in his dreams, but even more so because his dreams are just dreams at the end. They don't really mean anything. 
But when he comes through towards the end of the film, it was his dreams that stayed with him that helped him inspire him to do that out of everyone there. Yeah. I mean, I mean, going back to some of the influences and um, about being a square peg in a round hole in this bureaucratic, industrialized society, that is very much a big theme of Kafka, uh, Franz Kafka, the uh, Jewish German writer. Well, Jew- he wrote in German, I should say. And uh, particularly, Gillian was influenced by Or- Orson Welles' version of the trial, uh, where you get all this uh, systematic bureaucracy thrown at this character called Kay, who's really a Kafka himself. But it's very much this idea of the square peg in the, in the round hole and this nightmare bureaucratic world. That's, uh, that's another one. Uh, equally, you have uh, Jack Tati. I don't know if you've seen any films by Jack Tati. I doubt it because uh, he's, well, again, he's Jewish, but French filmmaker. Mm, I don't know, have you... And he has this character called Monsieur Hulot. And in two particular films, Mon Oncle and Playtime, you have again this very much this bureaucratic, ultra-modern world that this sort of retrograde character is thrown into, Monsieur Hulot. But I think it's very interesting, equally, that you've got sort of, again, two Jews with these characters who are square pegs in round holes seeing this nightmare in industrialized bureaucratic world because actually it's, it's something that we level back at the jews that they create this industrial machine of bureaucracy so um i, I think that that's uh, quite interesting because he also wrote the script did gilliam with tom stoppard who was a very famous playwright i've read his arcadia for example which is very sort of um <sighs> intellectual masturbation really uh, but, um, but here i think he uh, does rather well with the script with gilliam but equally you have again this sort of we don't quite fit in this society vision although we again uh, and one of the interesting things about we on the so-called far right which is a media term we on the the proper right we often see the same critique with society as it is and saw an interview I don't know if you've seen it with Clive James, the uh, Australian television presenter, journalist and writer. Have you seen this uh, interview at all? Uh, I'm not sure what interview you're talking about. No. Uh, it, it, it was um, for a series that Clive James did called Talking in the Library, uh, as in 2002. They addressed the fact that this film, Brazil, was one beloved of the so-called far right. And uh, Clive James immediately said, started virtue signaling and saying well oh you, you know they, they probably identify with the character of jack lint you know the the state torturer and everything and gilliam was was much more nuanced and he said no i actually the you know the the anti-authoritarian uh, critique is also theirs they critique this you know the society on from the same sort of angle which is true yeah there seems to be a shared uh contempt for authority being told what to do by this force that's above us and maybe controlling things but i think we all dislike that mm. i don't think it's just left and right i think it's everybody as a whole just doesn't like that so i wouldn't exactly say the film was right wing by any uh, means i think the far left uh, do enjoy their authoritarianism the, the far well, left mm. I, I think, think yeah i think their... some of them possibly get off but some i think some people on the right do that as well i think they get off in this this um, idea that we're being controlled, and I think <laughs> secretly they like it, if I'm honest with you. They right, want yeah, something uh, to fight against, or uh, like rebel against. Uh, I think, yeah, um, the, there are some, uh, for example, National Socialists and so on. Mm-hmm. They do love the idea of an authoritarian state, providing it looks after them. Mm-hmm. But they end up with a giant, faceless um, bureaucracy managing it. Yeah, they just want to overthrow this one so they can replace it with another one. Uh, yeah, pretty much so. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that'll work. But we, of course, uh, you know, are not interested in those kind of ideas. And mm. uh, we're of a proper right, if you like. Because the problem with, with national socialism is not nationalism, it's the socialism. Mm. With socialism, you'll always get a bureaucratic state. Mm. And you see Sam Lowry in this film. He clearly isn't interested by any of this because his dreams at the start of the film or him flying in the clouds and there's green fields. It looks like somewhere in England, maybe. And his 
trees and it's looking all beautiful and there's sunshine. His dreams are always interrupted by these nightmares of concrete jungle and cities and skyscrapers. And for someone like me, I, I can relate to that because I have no interest in saving London or taking cities back that have fallen. I, I don't want concrete. I want to be out there like him, flying above the clouds and the fields and the trees and enjoying nature. And that's what his dreams are about. His natural thing to dream about is the countryside. And I think, if I'm honest with you, a lot of the sort of leftist liberal types, they, they don't really like this nature. They don't like going outside into the trees. They like cities. They like big um, cities where you can do and say anything you want and get drunk and take drugs and all the rest of it. And Sam Lowry is maybe what they were getting at here. Maybe they're jealous of our, our, of our, our love for the countryside and nature. Well, uh, Gilliam himself is, is very much a leftist. And he's critiquing capitalism, basically. You can see that in, in the opening to the film, where you have, well, first of all, you have the clouds, of course, because this is going to be the big theme of being up in the clouds and everything away from all this, as you've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then you get the time, which is 8.49 p.m., which is very precise. <laughs> and, then, then, and then it says somewhere in the 20th century, which is extremely vague. So yeah. you've obviously got that farcical element. Mm -hmm. But 849 is, is, is very interesting because um, you've got the 9, 8 and 4 there of 1984, which, That's right. <laughs> you know, and, and, and the two double dots, I uh, suppose, could make a one. But equally, the 49, of course, was when 1984 actually came out. But then you get this shot of an advert. The, I want to talk to you about ducks. Do your ducks seem old fashioned, out of date? It introduces these central services and this blurb and everything. It's, it's, of course, in this shop full of televisions and this guy walking past with the supermarket. You just see the silhouette and then it all explodes. So you know that it's going to be a critique of capitalism. But someone of um, Gilliam's ilk would make an extreme error in judgment in that capitalist is right wing. But when it's not, as I always say, it came from Whig liberalism, which is the old left. So really, the, his critique is ours of capitalism. We will not see eye to eye in other ways, but we will see eye to eye with him on this because everybody hates the consumerist society. Yeah. Well, I think some people love it, to be honest with you. There are, there are many people now who are really starting to love it, though, I've noticed. Well, yes, you're right there. Mm -hmm. uh, overwhelmingly so. Um, I think a few years ago, I think you would have been right, but now I think people love it. People love this fast um, action lifestyle order something on Amazon and get it a few hours later delivered straight to your door. You don't Post have to go over out. Your and, Instagram yeah, and Twitter 10 yeah. minutes later. Yeah, shout out to Alexa that you want milk brought to you and it'll bring milk to you. It's crazy and I think people love it and they're really adopting this at a frightening level. Yeah, increasingly it seems to be people on the left who do love that lifestyle. The same people who go out campaigning for Greenpeace and for veganism and all this kind of shit can be seen in Starbucks on a weekend and, mm. uh, and so on. And they're there to be seen as well. Mm. And they go into all these swankiest bourgeois restaurants and so on and yet rail against capitalism and consumerism at the same time as though there's no contradiction. <laughs> yeah, they'll be sitting there <laughs> ranting about it, but they'll have their, their Nike trainers on. They'll have a Pringle um, jersey on, Levi jeans. They'll have an Audi. They'll have the sound system. They'll have all these little things in their house that make life easier. But they'll bitch and complain about the evil, uh, especially the evil white man taking everybody's money and getting richer off of it. I feel like yeah. saying to these people, well, stop spending your own fucking money then and save it up. Then you might have some. Yeah, uh, absolutely right. Just, just do what they do. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, they want to be looked after. They want all this stuff for free. That's the thing. And they don't really want to work for stuff. That's uh, that's the thing about the extreme left. They want the gibs, and uh, they don't want to do anything for it, really. They think that things should just drop out of the sky for them, and they should be provided for. It's also um, the question of even if you could wave a magic wand and all this stuff didn't harm the environment and it didn't deprive anybody of it else, is it still good for them to sit in a chair while a robot AI pumps and full of whatever they desire at the moment. Probably yeah. not healthy, even even if you could work out a way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that was mentioned about the so-called far right in the interview was that apparently you remember Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, 
and I didn't know this, uh, and I would have to verify this, but James and uh, Gilliam mentioned this in any case, that Timothy McVeigh, because he used quite a number of uh, pseudonyms, or nom de guerre or whatever, and two of them were Harry Buttle and Harry Tuttle. And so he was obviously inspired by the acts of terrorism against the capitalist system in Brazil. Hmm. Oh, he just really liked the movie. Mm. But well, yes, you know, he just uh, really liked the, the movie. But I think that he certainly was influenced by. It. But it's interesting that this is a film of the left and not of the right, and yet he's always described as Timothy McVeigh as someone of the far right, mm. which is very odd actually, because he was not a member of any far right group, mm. and yet he's always portrayed as that. Yeah, I so, think it's just so, because he's white, isn't it? That's just the... yeah, yeah. That, mm. That's basically it. Yeah. And, and it's obviously uh, politically convenient to put him under that. Yeah. Yeah. But he, he was also incensed with Timothy McVeigh about two uh, particular incidents. One was the Waco siege. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember that. Yeah, I, I, I've heard of it, but I, I can't remember. I was probably watching He-Man or something back then. I've seen some stuff in that not too long ago. It was quite shocking stuff. Yeah, well, uh, the FBI and everything went in and basically killed everybody uh, including women children and and so on and it was a very bizarre incident if you look into it mm. it was like something at a kind of soviet union sort of style tactics that was used it was really seemed out of place yeah yeah very, very much so as i say they laid siege to this compound and made a various number of claims about this compound that, he, you know, that the, there were religious nutcases, there were also allegations of paedophilia going on. But we'll never know what really happened because the FBI basically went in gung-ho and, and shot the place up and then burned it. Uh, so, and the other incident that inspired Timothy McVeigh was this uh, episode at Ruby Ridge, uh, which I don't know if you know, that one that was a year before Waco. So 1992 in this case. Yeah, that was another uh, one with bizarre justification for it too. And it was, yeah. It, it also had the one where they shot that woman holding a kid and stuff. It was absolutely horrendous protocols in place, whoever was in charge of that. That's right. And they really did their best to frame this family as being some kind of domestic terrorists when they'd done absolutely nothing other than decide that they were going to live off-grid in the mountains. And even well, that the, was it. And even the legal justification was essentially a sort of honey trap type thing, where they asked somebody to cut a shotgun for them. Yeah, you know, it was yeah. an actual. You know, so it's a federal employee asking a man to, oh, can you cut this shotgun after I've bought it for me? You know, that kind of thing, <laughs> which was that, turned out, oh, that was breaking the law there. But why is a federal employee trying to get people to break the law so they can then raid somebody's house under that justification? It's bizarre. Yeah, and Randy Weaver, the head of the family, actually wrote to Ronald Reagan to say that, look, I think I'm being set up here, that I'm going to get accused of wanting to assassinate you, basically, the president, and uh, it's not me at all, you know, but I'm sure that people are forging my signature and so on. And at his trial, they came out and said, He'd sent letters to the president claiming that he wanted to kill him, you know, even though he'd, mm. he'd sent one saying, it's not me. Um, <laughs> so uh, there's some bizarre stuff that are going on in there. It, and um, I mean, the government uh, eventually admitted liability and, and paid him out over three million dollars. But after you've lost your wife and kid, what's that? Mm. That's the trouble. They can do that three million. But does that undo... Well, one, the damage, no. But also, does it somehow make what made this whole thing possible impossible to happen again? If you see what I mean, you know, this yeah. whole structure and mentality that allowed them just to essentially siege and assault a family under the most ridiculous pretenses and then make a load of stuff up. They could do that again sometime unless something's changed and something's in place to prevent it, which I'm not aware of. I don't think $3 million payout's going to stop it. No. Uh, that's right. So coming back to the film here, we have this kind of state that does go around killing people, getting trumped up charges on people, uh, like the do the heroine in the film, uh, Kim Layton, is it? If I remember right, or Jill Layton, isn't it? 
they make stuff up about uh, issue warrants for arrest and and that kind of stuff, and eventually shoot her up. <laughs> in, in the end, although it's <laughs> off screen and you just hear the bullets, but no, I, you know, I, I'm by no means justifying what uh, Timothy McVeigh did here. Let me get that straight. I don't think that terrorism, domestic terrorism, is the answer because essentially, what has that achieved? Uh, it's achieved absolutely nothing in in the grand scheme of things, and uh, it's uh, often used as a stick to demonise what the media call the far right. So there's no point in in doing that kind of thing. But it just goes to show that although Terry Gilliam is is a leftist, creating this film, this is why it appeals to people on the so-called far right. You notice that there's a line by Michael Palin's character. He says something to the effect of, um, we got the wrong man, but the wrong man became the right man. And I didn't question that. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's, right. And that's, it, it, that's That's what they would do. I mean, nobody think that they're above it. They'll be able to get off with it. You've got a clean, a clean nose, a clean sheet. Well, I wonder how long that would last if they really wanted to like, throw you away. Yeah, and, and in, in this case, of course, it's all to cover up mistakes that are made in the ministry, in the Ministry of Information. Mm, which is renowned for, well, in the film, just being really inefficient. And, and I'm sure that efficiency is a, a crime in the movie. So everything's um, crap. Nothing works. Um, every, everybody's late. The electronics don't work. They've got these impractical heating ducts. Everything just seems to be... It's awful, like really poorly thought out. And any notion to, to sort that out or rectify things properly the right way, they're like, no, no, we're not doing that. We're just doing what we're told. Just carry on. <laughs> you get a great impression that this whole world was designed by committees and bureaucracies that never, ever were anywhere near or understood the situation they were trying to shape them for. Even yeah. things like the restaurant, when they're ordering, it has to say the number and they've got these... It'll light up menu with pictures on it to choose from. The whole system's clunky and awkward for no reason at all. Other than the fact you can imagine somewhere a bureaucracy, a committee said, oh, that was a wonderful idea. They've passed it and now that's the rules. And when the food comes to them, it's all the same. It's just this glob of, looks like green mints or something <laughs> like that in the middle of the plate. So it doesn't really matter what they order. They're getting the same thing. Except They the just think picture. that they're getting a choice. We've got a wee picture on it, what it's meant to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. But it comes down to an obsession with numbers in the film. That they're slowly reducing everyone down to uh, numbers. Like when Sam Lowry changes his department, all of a sudden, because it's a higher department, is is known by a number. And in fact, he doesn't realize that the guy who he wants to see is his friend Jack Lint, because he's just known by a number in the ministry. Yeah, and the air duct, um, the heating guys come down, Bob Hoskins, um, and the other guy who always repeats everything Bob Hoskins' character says, Sam uh, says to him, have you got like a, a 9303 dash 6 or whatever it is? And they're like, no, we haven't got one of those. And you're thinking to yourself, what the hell is that? But these people obviously know what it is. They obviously know exactly what that is. They don't have a description for it. They have a number for it. Yeah. Um, actually, the form that they have to go back and get that Sam Lowry quotes is a reference to George Orwell. It's, oh. it's, a, it's a reference to the apartment that he used to live in while he was writing 1984. Okay. A little um, nod to his, his old life. Yeah. It's uh, 27 B stroke six, isn't it? And uh, George Orwell used to live at flat 27B Cannonbury Square, up six half flights of stairs. Mm. <laughs> well, I never knew that. Now we know what it is, exactly. Just got it off Wikipedia now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you could have tricked us and pretended you knew that. Oh, no, you should have claimed it was good memory. <laughs> I was really impressed there. I I'm know. just disappointed. I, I, I'm a magician that reveals his tricks. I'm terrible. Uh, <laughs> and and sometimes they're the easiest ones as well. But yeah, uh, there's a lot of this bureaucratic spiel and so on that goes on throughout the film. Endless paperwork. Of course, Robert De Niro's character in the end, Harry Tuttle, gets swept away in a mass of paperwork in a very surrealist 
scene. Mm. Which is strange, but considering that the reason he's he's in the danger, the, the trouble he's in, is because of a smear on a, a piece of paper. Got a slight a, a, a thing that happened is a quirk of fate when the, the, the bug falls into the typewriter and the name gets mixed up. It's for something as simple as that. All these well, that, big events come al- come along. Well, no, he he's not in trouble because of that. Uh, Harry Buttle. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Gets, gets killed yeah. because of that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, he, he gets carted away and tortured to death because of a because of a bug that goes That's... onto a typewriter and and suddenly a, a B forms instead of a T. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. For Archibald Buttle instead of Archibald Tuttle. And of course, the the reason that they want Jill Layton in after so long is because she's causing too much trouble investigating this cock up that the Ministry of Information has made. Mm. And so that then they see her as a threat. It's Jack Lind, who basically, you know, uh, basically says uh, she's obviously a terrorist. Mm. And, yeah, yeah. and, and Sam, Sam Shock and says, how can you connect her, you know, with, with terrorism? Because obviously she's just trying to get this, uh, this mistake sorted and get some kind of compensation for Mrs. Bottle, who's in permanent shock. And mm. Jack Lind says everything is connected. <laughs> it's interesting to see Pale and play quite a sinister character for a change. Yeah, because he's still nice, isn't he? He's still got that nice smiley face that we're all familiar with. Oh, it's old Michael, but he, he plays a bit of a shitbag, and it's it's a little bit strange. But then again, that's how it would be in society. You you have these people in authority who might smile and give us a, a good spiel and wink and have this good um, repertoire with us, but. Behind those eyes, there's a shit bag. The family man torturer. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and and even his daughter's there in his office when he comes back in blood soaked from uh, doing some torturing. Yeah. But that's also interesting in that Gilliam and and Tom Stoppard had a bit of a falling out over that because Tom Stoppard, who, as I say, is Jewish, he wanted ba- him to basically be this demonic sort of Nazi type figure. And uh, Gilliam said, no, 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 no. He's got to be the nicest guy you can possibly meet in the street. Mm. Yeah. It would be too easy just to dress him up with the full black, like, SS regalia and the skull and crossbones and all that. It'd be, that'd be too easy. If you make him a normal person, like your teacher, maybe, the nice guy in the street. And that makes it a lot more terrifying mm. because that's how it really is. And people will relate that to that more. The, yeah. The banality of evil, I think the phrase is. Mm. Yeah, Hannah Arendt, isn't it? That uh, came up with that one. We ended up going out with uh, with Heidegger. Very strange relationship that, hmm. especially as um, Heidegger joined the National Socialists, and uh, although he then uh, didn't renew his membership uh, when they came into power, but <laughs> but fancy going out with a Jewess like Hannah Arendt seems bizarre. Hmm. Cause, you know, someone who was very much interested in ethnic. Uh, discourses um, in relation to meaning and existence. But anyway, very bizarre. Mm. I've gone off on a tangent again, haven't I? Uh, slightly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we'll, we'll get back onto it. Um, so the, there are many features of the capitalist society, consumer society that are critiqued. Uh, one of the big ones is cosmetic surgery, of course, that comes up every so often. That's right. Really uncomfortable scenes, these, <laughs> and you, the, the cosmetic surgery in the aftermath. Mm. Yes, yeah, that, that's right. And uh, these, uh, there's this element of, um, well, both trying to cheat the aging process, which obviously is so with Sam's mother, uh, who has a string of toy boy lovers and so on. But equally, there's a certain element of being in vogue as well because there's the uh, friend of Sam's mother who tries this revolutionary acid treatment which goes disastrously wrong mm. so so there is uh, that as well and she's always making excuses up for his obvious incompetence yeah I mean, that, that's, uh, that's sadly, yeah I mean, that's sadly how a lot of the, um, celebrities are now that they're they're actually promoting Young, even young people to go ahead and have these kind of surgeries, get Botox, things injected in their bums and all the rest of it, things injected into their lips, 
and it's crazy. And, and this old lady, she's got this desire to live longer and look as youthful as possible for as long as possible. But now we see in society that even young people are, are getting infected with this stuff, even when they are young and beautiful and they don't need all that crap. Yeah. And in fact, it can go disastrously wrong, as we've seen with people like Mickey Rourke. Yeah. Uh, so, so this. Kim Kardashian, everyone. Who's that? Donatella Versace? Oh, oh Donatella like Versace. Yeah. Or... yeah. Well, th- this is the thing that Gillian was asked if this is science fiction. And he said, no, it's a documentary. <laughs> he said all this exists in the world somewhere and i've just concentrated it so like for example the stuff on people paying for their own torture where they have to pay for the expense of the manpower and appliances used and stuff like that apparently went on in south america <laughs> and um, and obviously the horrific stories of uh, cosmetic surgery. I, I even saw that in an episode of Quincy, uh, you know, with, with Jack Klugman. That was that must have been back end of the 1970s when that first came out. So they were talking about it even then. This is quite an eternal truth now that we've reached the industrial age, that these things will not go away, what uh, Terry Gilliam's criticizing and um, critiquing. And this is uh, what makes the film, I think, very relevant to us still now. Mm. Uh, one of the things I think that keeps it relevant as well is this retrofuturistic technology. Ah, so it can never to say the same there. <laughs> <laughs> Beat me to it. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> no, no, boys. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's, it's, it's something that's already seemingly archaic and yet futuristic at the same time cannot date. That's a brilliant way of doing it. Equally, I thought that there was a lot of Blade Runner's influence on that. Mm-hmm. Go and tell us. No, just with the um, the screens and so on. And his love of Fresnel mm. lenses. Do you notice that? It seems to keep coming yeah. up. Yeah, this is what okay. I mean. Yeah, the lenses and everything. Yeah, because he he did that deliberately. Did uh, Terry Gilliam? He got the smallest screen that he could find, and then put a lens over it. <laughs> <laughs> So, so he, he was deliberately thinking as perversely as possible for the technology. Hmm. I'm going to have a watch uh, out for the next time. And, and, and it's the same with, for example, the woman who takes down the, she's like the court reporter, but the torture reporter, really. And uh, she, she has to take down all the screams and confessions and things like that. Uh, and she's got this sort of device on her fingers to obviously make a typing easier on the fingers and everything but how would it because you, you know you you would have to press the thing to make it work in any case right okay yeah so it can't work if you like and and yet for for, for some reason we, we're led to believe this yeah and i think that's maybe another one of the things uh, like i was speaking about before how everything just seems so impractical nothing works nothing work sufficiently nothing seems to do us like a job well everything's falling apart even though they have all these good gadgets that do everything they're all really crap at it nothing mm. works it's like so who who the hell made this the other thing that reminds me of blade runner as well is the architecture mm. the, the the cityscape itself reminds me very much of blade runner i don't know if you got that feel to it or, or not well are, are all dystopian films of this kind of nature they're all fairly similar in that regard. Even Escape from New York, I thought some of the architecture was pretty similar. And I think that a lot of these dystopian films share that element, with concrete jungle, high rises, skyscrapers. Mm. But this one's a little bit different because this is like your everyday normal kind of guy um, and not Snake Plissken or not um, Decker from, from Blade Runner. And this is just a normal guy when he becomes this, this angel in armor in his dreams. That's who he wishes he could be in this concrete jungle environment he's actually in. Mm. So they're all they're all very similar, but their sights are nuances there, in the way they tell the story. But essentially, the backgrounds and the sets and settings are the same. Yeah, very, very much so. Uh, one thing was the interiors as well, because you have some interiors like Deckard's apartment, for example, which is hyper modern, just like Sam Lowry's is. 
mm. but then you have you have some which are quite archaic like for example Sam Lowry's mother's apartment mm. and e- equally you had that with Jeff Sebastian's apartment but you notice though um, and I'm just thinking back to Blade Runner now despite the fact that we're in the future and we have this efficiency and everything's ultra modern everything's still dirty and grimy and dusty and dark and gloomy that's right because well i mean even if you look now the level of incompetence has increased with the level of technology Mm. incredible as that may seem but yeah it's so i think the more you have a reliance on other things doing something for you the lazier and sloppier you get yeah yeah Mm. because you're yeah the machine that cleans your kitchen i'll clean your kitchen um, but then you need a machine to clean your bookshelf and then you need a machine to clean out your pets or whatever. And everything just seems dirty and grimy, uh, despite yeah. the, the, this modern setting that it's in with these flashing lights and cars that fly and laser guns and all the rest of it. Everyone just seems to be living in perpetual dirt. That's right. Uh, I mean, I come from a generation where you had to learn time times tables and sums and everything in your head. You had to be able to do them in no your calculators. Head. No, no calculators. Mm-hmm. Um, calculators were just starting out when um, I was uh, in primary school, and we started having calculators and so on. Calculator watches, calculator watches, and so on. But but they weren't scientific calculators. They were, they came later. They they came when I was in secondary school. But even so, there were certain exams where you were not allowed to take a calculator in with you, so you had to do certain calculations and so on on paper or in your head mm. i don't think that goes on anymore well when i was at school now uh, well, i left in 1998 and we're allowed calculators then in fact we i don't think we we're even allowed to do the mass test without one i think we had to have a t- calculator there mm. we had to have a sign uh, w- when i did gcse's and a levels uh we had to have a scientific calculator for the more complex stuff there was a section where you weren't allowed it and there was a section where you were where you had to have it yeah so you, you know you your arithmetic where you had to calculate stuff and uh, particularly equations and stuff like that you had to do on paper without a calculator things like quadratics and so on you had to do on paper uh, yeah. and not on a calculator not everybody's as smart as Rachel Riley <laughs> Uh, no, but unfortunately, fewer and fewer people will become as smart as Rachel Riley or Carol Vorderman even. Yeah, be, 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 me, don't worry. Be, because apart from the the top tier who will get smarter, the people who are actually going to become computer programmers and uh, people working on things like AI and robotics and so on, they will get smarter. But there will be an increasing uh, and ever larger lumpen proletariat who won't even be able to do basic maths. They're the people who all the thinking and effort that the ordinary people would have to do every day has now been taken over by machines. Yeah. Well, the people who design the machines might have to keep being, as you say, smarter and smarter and know more and more to keep up the progress. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And it keeps people down. It keeps people from in, from aspiring to stuff. Mm. Because if you keep them ignorant, then they won't know what to aspire to, or they won't feel that they'll ever be able to achieve it. And of course, the uh, real danger in all that evolution is what happens when you get to the point where the machine or the system itself now does everything, where it takes care of development, future progress, and no people are really needed. There's no genius, there's no great individual anymore. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and so that's one of the reasons for incompetence and also for a certain amount of sociop- uh, sociopathy where people have to sort of disguise their incompetence. And you have that a lot in this film, uh, particularly with the character of Mr. Kurtzman. It's interesting, actually, that Mr. Kurtzman, of course, he shares his surname with the founder of Mad Magazine, Harvey Kurtzman. So there's a little nod towards one of uh, Gilliam's influences there. All right. Yeah, there's <laughs> also it, these little hidden deep. Yeah, but equally there's a joke, because 
the guy who plays uh, Kurtzman, Ian Holm, is short of stature. And of course, uh, you know, if you translate it literally from German, it would mean short man. Right. And, and, and so he's a short man in all senses, both intellectually as well. Uh, but, but, but he has a sort of mean intelligence as well. Yeah. Uh, in, in the, in, in the end, actually to, to get out of the problems, he, he shops Sam Lowry for forging his signature, which he's done with Kurtzman's consent. <laughs> you remember it where, where, oh, my hand has gone limp and everything. Oh, I can't. Oh, I'm such a pathetic man, you know. And, and of course, Sam ends up doing all the work for him. And so there, there is a certain shrewdness in, in people's incompetence. So, yeah, uh, there are other incompetents, like, for example, Bob Hoskins' character. He also has this sociopathic attitude. But, but you have that in middle management in any case and in people in the trades where they do seem to do everything to piss you off. Uh, yeah, especially, yeah. especially if you've lived in France. <laughs> but, you, so, but you're, you're right. It seems to be like a, a thing that, you know, a lot of people could relate to this. And I'm sure everyone listening does will feel the same or has felt the same at some point in which you, you feel you're being pushed around or manipulated or bullied by some kind of authority, whether it's at your work or school or university or, or wherever. And you thought to yourself, this, is this dickhead really telling me what to do? This little short man who, who obviously has got nothing else in his life other than this and using this um, role that he's in, it's a way to feel bigger about himself. But that's all they will ever be. But despite that, Sam Lowry's character, he's being pushed around and manipulated by this character, but he, he's a strong one. He's the one that rises above it and gets through it. And he does as he's told, and he suffers from it, and he's punished at certain points in the film, but at the end of it, he's come out tops. And that's what these people will never be able to achieve, because they're being put into top positions. They've never fought for it. They've never had to strive or work for it. They're just put there. So they don't really know how to be leaders. They don't know how to tell people what to do or how to interact with folk because they're put into positions where they're there already. Well, I mean, I mean Sam Lowry dies in the end, of course. Or, yeah. Or, but, or goes mad. Yeah, but he, he's still the one that fought or and, and rose above it. He was, yeah, he, he was a different one. He was a different one, the one that didn't quite fit in. Mm. And he, uh, but, but, but I think that in, in the end, the system... The, the idea, just like in Orwell's 1984, is that the system wins. Mm. Uh, be, because once the system's in place, there's nothing you can do. Which is a very pessimistic view, and I don't share it. But... Yeah, that's, I'm, I'm the same. I don't really share it at all. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that this will not be here forever. Maybe it will be in my lifetime. I won't be able to do anything about it myself. And I probably won't see a change in my lifetime. But it will come down eventually. Um, I don't think it's there forever and ever and ever. Yeah. We will get on actually to the uh, connections uh, between Brazil and 1984. Okay. Because unless uh, you've got anything more to add on that sort of stuff, uh, the social no, context and so on. Um, yeah. Uh, but um, did, did you notice the connections between uh, this film and 1984? Well, I think it was just the same film, if I'm honest with you. It was just a, a slightly different tone. I think it was just Gilliam's take on it. Yeah, a more satirical, funny. It's like it's like the if Monty Python made 1984. I think it's the same film. Which is odd, considering yeah. the fact he's never read the book. Has he not? No. <laughs> well, there's enough. I think there's enough sort of mythology and. Uh, yeah, he said he never read it. <laughs> I find that very odd. Well, not cuisine. really, because the people that made the new Star Wars films had never other obviously seen the original ones. Mm. He's maybe seen the televised versions rather than the. But he, he said he's never read it. Uh, that's uh, I find it astounding, actually, because he, oh. he, he it was put under the working title 1984 and a half, mm. Ma, which I'm a, was. I'm afraid I, I used the the same source you did. <laughs> I just read it before before going on here. <laughs> All right. Uh. Yeah. So. Uh, um, but he was yeah, inspired he... by it, but he never read it. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how that works, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, he, he may have seen uh, the... Uh, well, there, there are a couple of interpretations on film of 1984 before this film came out. Um, Surprisingly, no, in, later. In, in, fact, in fact, actually, all, all three versions of 1984 came out on film before this. And in fact, the, the previous one, uh, which was the one with John Hurd, was in 1984. So it was the year before this came out. Mm. Uh, but equally, I, I think you must have seen Nigel Neal's version with Peter Cushing in it. Is there a reference uh, in there to it? There are a lot of references to 1984 in general, particularly the torture scene at the end, because, of course, Winston's tortured uh, in the end. And equally, when Jill and Sam get captured, that is exactly how it happens by the Thought Police in 1984. They're caught in bed together and they come crashing in through the windows and uh, walls and everything. And, uh, you you know, uh, but, but it's in a... It's not in Winston's mother's apartment or anything. It's, it's in a private apartment that they've been renting out from this uh, old guy who runs the curiosity shop who's actually really a, an agent for the ministry. But anyway, there's also a little shot of room 101. I don't know if you noticed that, which is the uh, room where Winston gets tortured in. So when, when Sam starts working for information retrieval, and he goes into his new office. There's a shot down the corridor, and right close to us in uh, on the right is this room, and I think it says TZ101 or something like that. And uh, but but uh, you know it's definitely 101, and so right. that's the room that Winston gets tortured in, room 101 in 1984. Mm-hmm. So there are little references here and there. <clears throat> In Room 101, that's like the, uh, there was a TV show back in the 90s, I think, called Room 101. It kind of had a little bit of a reference to 1984 and that TV show where something you didn't like would go into this room and get rid of. And you never see it again. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, that's right. Yeah, you just disappear off the face of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and of course... Jack Lint, uh, he's more or less an O'Brien figure in that he's very friendly to Sam, but yet he turns out to be his torturer in the end. And those kind of little references. And so the, uh, also the, the endless squalor, one thing that when you read 1984 that sticks out at you is the immense amount of squalor in it. And you certainly have that in Brazil. Mm-hmm. So, and that's um, in the streams as well, the... the sort of ghouls in, in rags and they're, they're bearing these chains and they're pulling um, all the time. They're just, that's all they're there for. They're just in persistent squalor all the time. Yeah, and that brings us nicely on to the surrealistic aspect of the film. Well, what did you reckon to these surrealist uh, dream sequences, really? Well, like I said um, earlier on the show, I, I thought they were very, they, they struck me as almost like an opera. And when he's flying around and the, the, the big samurai um, shogun thing clips his wings and they have this sword battle and he has this duel and he gets a lucky strike in the one he, he gets a lucky strike and the, the samurai, giant samurai figure vanishes. And I think we've all had those dreams where we've been attacking something, we can't hit it. So even though they're very surreal, that's what dreams are. And we can all relate to that. We can all relate to that feeling of helplessness, of having this enemy in our dreams, which we can't seem to defeat. So they're not really surreal. They're just um, what dreams are. Yeah, well, of course, they're allegories of his waking life as well in many ways, aren't they? This samurai is this big steel monstrosity, and, and when he injures it, all this gas comes out. So it's, it's very much an industrial allegory there. And equally, when he kills it in one of the dreams that he has, he lifts off the mask, and of course, it's him in almost a, um, not the Return of the Jedi, um, the one before Empire Strikes Back moment, yeah. where he goes down into the into the cave, and Darth Vader's there, and he confronts Darth Vader, and he cuts off his head and looks inside the mask, and of course, it's him in the mm-hmm. mask. Because, of course... He is part of that industrial machine. He, he's a cog in it. Uh, but he's fighting against it at the same time. He seems to be. 
his dreams seem to be him fighting against this industrialization of, of his own green country. Something I think we can all relate to when we see a new road being built or a new council estate being built or something like that. And we see um, this, this green luscious fields being torn up and we want to fight against it. And we want to go out there and stop these things from being built and designed, but we can't. Um, it's, it's working against us. And that's the, the, what the dreams are like. You, you can't fight against this. And maybe uh, what it is is his instincts are still healthy and desire what is good. You know, he wants to be a hero. He likes nature and so on. And he has those kind of dreams. But in his waking life, he might not even be fully aware of it. He just feels frustrated and confused and dissatisfied. Mm. Yeah. And there's no notion uh, that he ever actually went to any of these green places before. Like he's ever actually been to visit one of these lush green fields. But he dreams about it. Mm. That's right, they don't seem to exist within the waking mm. world in this film, do they? It's like Dark City, in a way. Yeah, very much so, that's right. Which is also, of course, uh, based on German Expressionism and Film Noir, which is the uh, one of the, well, two of the big aesthetics in this film. Mm. And, and, of course, you can see, by the way he dresses, that it's very much influenced by Film Noir, um, very, very 1940s style. And also explored a lot of these themes far better than the Matrix dig. Let's get another dig in at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Matrix is shit. Yeah, but I, I think that also the uh, dream sequence. Um, uh, there's the uh, you you've mentioned, of course, having you know the the, the wings uh, uh, cut. I would use the word wings clipped. Clipped. Yes. That's, that, that's the metaphor there, really. That this uh, society is clipping, you know, he's constantly having his wings clipped all the yeah. time. He's flying away too much, clip his wings. Yeah. And, and when he tries to fly away uh, and, and rescue Jill uh, at one point, of course, he gets held back by the ground itself, which then uh, has, suddenly has Mr. Kurtzman's face on it. <laughs> uh, did, did, did you notice that? That, he, uh, that it was Kurtzman. Uh, and he goes, no, don't leave, don't leave. <laughs> because referring, <laughs> yeah, referring back, of course, to the fact that Kurtzman doesn't want him to leave uh, the department because, of course, Kurtzman himself is completely incompetent and lost without him, mm, yeah. even though he's uh, Lowry's superior. Yeah, and he, he's always berating him, but yet he, he needs him because he knows without him he'll be fucked effectively. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. But it's an accurate the whole thing, an accurate metaphor for these bureaucratic systems, uh, socialist systems or whatever, where they have to basically punch down and constantly keep everybody down to conform to the system because in the kind of systems we would like, there's a place for some great genius or great person that could rise up, but there's no place for that in a bureaucratic system where everybody has to fit exact parameters, conform to a system tick bo these boxes and <laughs> file this letter and so on. That system hates those kind of people. It wants people just to simply fit in the small boxes they have ready for them and completely mm. follow to the letter the path they've set out from the start. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and keep you away from the things that really do matter to you the most. And mm. I I'll say it again, nature, um, yeah. you're not going to get healthy or a good healthy mind or, or body or, or even spirit if you believe in those sorts of things if you stay in a concrete jungle and all you see is office buildings all day and cars and traffic and traffic lights and signs pointing directions and telling you where to go and what to do you want to be out there where there aren't signs and there aren't rules to tell you what to do and what not to do and we all have those desires even if we've probably never most of us probably haven't even been to these places mm -hmm. i feel sorry for people who have been in big cities have never seen the countryside there's people out there who've never seen the ocean before or never been in a forest. They've been in a city their whole life, but they probably dream about going to these places. And sadly yeah. substitute it probably with some farming simulator game on Facebook or <laughs> something on the Nintendo you know, Switch. Or like a, yeah, a game, a, a PlayStation game. And uh, the thing is, these games now, I mean, I've played them um, myself and they look ultra realistic, but they're not real. They're just a game. They're just something just to like laze away with on a, on a Saturday night or whatever. But if you go out to a, a real one, you, you'll feel yourself changing. And that's the one of the themes of this film, I think. They don't 
want us to have those dreams. They don't want us to go to these places because they know if we do go there often, then we're going to stop going to the cities and stop forking out money. We're going to stop going there and paying for things and things like that, parking tickets, cinemas, whatever, restaurants. Forests are free. They don't cost anything. And that's, that's what right. they, they, the people in these films, and even in Dark City, they keep them locked in these cities. They don't let them escape. They don't let them go anywhere. Because they know that when they do, they'll be more adventurous. If you're more adventurous, then you're going to open your mind up to things. I think that one of the things as well about the dreams is that you've always got that symbolic conflict between who we would like to be and what he has to be. That's a conflict that we all have, really, that everyone has to work. Everyone has to be a part of the system in a way to earn money. But equally, we also have our private lives and we can combat the system. We can also use the money to combat the system as well in our enterprises, in our private lives, even in, you know, simple things like, you know, gardening or something like that, because supporting nature is contrary to what the current leftist regime are all about. You know, they're all about urban development basically concreting over our green spaces and so on. So that flies in the face of leftism. But equally, of course, you can do what we do, and that's cultural stuff. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. And I noticed as well, as I think, especially in the 90s growing up, they almost made out anybody who, who wants to protect nature, who wants to do stop developments of airports or, or, or roads or whatever, as these smelly kind of dreadlocked hippies that live in tents and excavation sites or whatever but it doesn't have to be like that just because you share a, a dislike of nature being torn up and concreted over it doesn't mean like you're this sort of hippie who wears tie-dye shirts it opposes all equally but if you, you're brought up in that kind of environment where everything is concrete and everything's um, lights and neon lights and traffic then you're not going to really have much vested interest in the country and that's exactly what they want yeah now I'm going to come on to the last sort of thing, which is the direction, uh, Terry Gilliam's direction uh, in general. So the craftsmanship of the film, because I think that this is a very rich film. And I, I don't know if uh, you can't, uh, kind of noticed anything, any interesting features of the film that you'd like to share. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm fine, uh, James. The main thing I thought was the, the depth, the detail in every scene which I did appreciate that you weren't just given a a superficial layer of detail for what you, the main characters are focusing on. In the background, everything fitted the theme, like we are talking about the bizarre gadgetry and so on, the behaviour of people, so everything was uh, very sort of complete, which is a good mm-hmm. sign for a director, the fact that he's got this eye for detail. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the detail in particular I thought was outstanding. And also a, a lot of detail w- which added to the humour, um, particularly the dark irony and satire of the film. Like, for example, when Sam shares a, an office and, of course, there's the table that's between the two offices with the wall in between, but, the, you know, the, you can move the table between the wall. So the wall's been sort of cut around the table. Um, <laughs> they have this little fight over getting more of the table. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that, that was foregrounded. But did you notice in the background that there were also posters that had been halved by the wall and a filing cabinet? <laughs> 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 so little things like that, you know, the attention to detail that's really subtle, I think is fantastic. There are also a lot of posters everywhere urging you to be suspicious of your best friend and stuff like that. Or oh, the one at the, the opening where it says... Loose talk is noose talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. Very subtle in the information ministry. <laughs> yeah. I think it was like a little nod to, to people who live in houses and they have feuds or their defense in their back garden and peeps over their neighbor's territory and they fight well, yeah. and they go back and forth and saying this is going to happen in the future, even when we're in apartments that are built specially for you where there's no such thing as houses. Even then you're going to be fighting over this stuff. Well, it reminded me very much of an episode of Steptoe and Son, if you've ever watched that, oh, where, really? yeah, where Albert and his uh, son, uh, Harry, is he called Harry? 
I know he's called Harry Harold. H. Corbett. Harold, that's right, yeah. Harold. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, Harold, yeah. <laughs> he's called Harry, Harry H. Corbett, the, the, the actor. They, uh, they split the house down the middle at one time. And I'm sure that that's a nod uh, equally to, to that. You know, he got the idea at least from that because as a comedy writer, he, he will have watched all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. and, um, and, and he worked with Harry H. Corbett on one of his films as well. Mm -hmm. So he was very much familiar with his work. But yeah, e equally, there is the the bit where he starts working uh, information retrieval and he walks through the door. And did you notice that the opening of the door with the shadows and everything, it framed him in like a coffin shadow? Did, did you oh, notice that? I so, like a forebear of doom. That's right, yeah. He sort of foreshadowed his own doom. <laughs> and um, yeah. also little things on, on for example, um, religion as well, which features quite a lot. You've you got uh, Consumers for Christ, uh, which was this like Salvation Army type group, uh, little brass band, you know, collecting money and everything, called Consumers for Christ. Did you notice that? <laughs> uh, sort of floating yeah. past. Just, you yeah. know, just sort of floating past, adding to the richness of the whole thing. Mm. Is, that, is that saying, like, yeah, like like I said before, even in the future, there's still going to be people who cling on to this Jesus thing? Yeah, very, very much so. And, of course, you have the funeral, or at least it's a funeral in the dream sequence at the end, uh, where the best friend of Sam's mother dies because of all the cosmetic surgery with the acid that she's had. And she's, uh, yeah, you know, and, and, that's just going to be a good idea for cosmetics. Yeah, but of course it's all ultra modern, and so you have neon crosses and stuff like that in it. And equally on on the Jesus theme, uh, theme, did you notice right at the very end when you see Sam in close up from behind, and you just see his hand on the chair? Did you notice uh, that that he got a wound coming out from the the middle of his hand like stigmata? Did you notice that? All right, yeah. So sort of um, foregrounding, uh, foregrounding him as this uh, Christ-like figure. Well, he does dream about being an angel. Now, I don't believe in any of this nonsense, but, I mean, the, the angelic thing, that's a Christian belief. Yeah. Largely, anyway. Yeah, so there's lots much. of like, um, biblical things. And like you said, the neon crucifixes, nowadays they're, they're made of gold, silver, and wood, and stone, and marble, and all these fancy, precious things that cost lots of money. But in the future, they're going to be neon signs. Well, well, they, they they are now. If you look in New York and places yeah. like that, when you get these missions, they're very much uh, lit up in neon. So, yeah. as Gilliam said, he didn't really invent anything. Everything that was that he used for the film was already there in the societies that he was critiquing. So yeah, it wasn't really too different from reality, is it? The film. I mean, it, it is a film at the end of it, but. It's not really that far away from what society is like now. And there's nothing in there that you can't believe will happen or is happening. No. Any good satire or critique has to be that way, really, doesn't it? Or else it's too removed from reality to fit or yeah. seem right. Mm -hmm. Well, my take on it is that you, it's very difficult to write satire these days because the society that we've got is in itself a satire of a society. <laughs> yeah. I mean, imagine what satire is going to be like. Think about this. It's, it might horrify you. In, in 10 years' time, what is a satirical film going to be like? I mean, it's, it, there's going to be a point when that satire starts becoming funny and starts becoming horrific. Yeah, that's right. And uh, has anyone else uh, anything to add? No, no, no. I th think, think I'm happy with that. Then uh, that's where we shall leave it. <laughs> so uh, goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Goodbye for me. Hope to see you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye.